Welcome back to NAS 299-499 here at Sitting Bull College, our Tribal Sovereignty and Contemporary Supreme Court Jurisprudence class. I'm your instructor, Kara Damari. Today we're going to be looking at United States v. Lara, a 2004 case. As usual, we'll check out the parties, go through some of the issues, uh, look a little bit at the procedural posture, and uh, definitely touch on the rule and the holding of the case. So unlike usual, in this case, we won't spend that much time discussing the story of the case. Normally, I like to go through the case almost as if it is a story, like, for example, with Nevada versus Hicks, because it gets in your mind, right? You remember the bighorn sheep, you remember them coming to the property, you remember Mr. Hicks fed up, you know, and going to tribal court, and then you can remember the case from there. However, in this case, uh, as was made clear at oral argument in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, the exact specifics of the tribe um, aren't, say, as important as in uh, even United States versus White Mountain Apache, right, when we were looking at a specific 1960 act related to White Mountain Apache tribe. In this case, in the oral argument, um, on one side we have uh, the United States, right, represented by the same person we saw in United States versus White Mountain Apache, uh, Solicitor General Theodore Olson, and some other deputy solicitors and assistant attorneys representing the United States. And then on the other side, we have uh, Mr. Lara, right? Billy Joe Lara, represented by counsel appointed by the court. And I wanted to pay particular attention to the fact that in most of these cases, once they get up to the Supreme Court, the story of the case is really lost, right? And the court is deciding broader principles. And so listen in for a second to the end of Mr. Lara's uh, counsel. Um, so Mr. Lara's the respondent, right? Listen to his counsel at the end of his oral argument in front of the Supreme Court here. I ask this court to affirm the decision of the Eighth Circuit and to find that Billy Joe's Billy Joe Lara's subsequent federal prosecution violated double jeopardy. Okay, so that's Mr. Lara's attorney, uh, and the Supreme Court pronounces it Lara, and so even though his Mr. Lara's attorney says Laura there, I'm going to continue to say Lara. And then you'll hear Justice Rehnquist cut in here. Can I ask just one question? Of, of what tribe is Lara a member? The uh, sta or the well, well it'll, it'll be in the record. Do you know if there? So that's kind of interesting, right? It's interesting because he almost starts to say potentially Standing Rock, right? Mr. Lara is not a member of the Standing Rock case or tribe as Standing Rock Sioux tribe here, as we will uh, discuss in a second. But that just goes to show you that even the you know attorney appointed by the court for Mr. Lara, uh, you know, had a moment where he he didn't remember what tribe Mr. Lara is a member of, because when things get to the Supreme Court, sometimes those are truly actually less important details because the question that is being asked and the issue that is being argued uh, doesn't actually relate to the tribe. So that's kind of an interesting little tidbit there as we get started. So the events that started this case uh, were in the present day area of North Dakota. And actually, if we zoom in here, we can see the Spirit Lake Reservation. Uh, and then if we zoom out, we can drive about an hour and a half uh, north by sort of northwest over to the Dunseeth and Belcourt area and find the Turtle Mountain Reservation. Uh, Turtle Mountain are uh, Chippewa, Ojibwe people, um, as you know, and actually that is the, the tribe that Mr. Lara is a member of, but he is over here on the Spirit Lake Reservation. And he was arrested for public intoxication. Uh, this is in 2001. He was brought to the police department, uh, the VA police department, I believe, uh, the officers there told him that he was uh, excluded from the Spirit Lake Nation Reservation. Uh, I don't know if that's similar to what we consider sort of banishment here on Standing Rock, 
uh, but he was told that there was an exclusion order against him on Spirit Lake. And after he was told that, he hit one of the BIA police officers uh, by the name of Byron Swan. So he was charged with violations of the Spirit Lake Tribal Code, including violence to a policeman, uh, trespassing, disobedience to a lawful order of the tribal court, resisting lawful arrest, and that public intoxication. A couple days later, he pleads guilty to three of the tribal charges, including the violence against the police officer, resisting lawful arrest, and public intoxication, and he was sentenced to a term of 155 days in jail, okay? So let's look at this timeline uh, a little bit more laid out like this. We've got June 13th, middle of the summer, Lair is arrested for the public intoxication. Uh, then he goes back to the jail and assaults the BIA officer, right? And he's pled guilty to this. June 15th, a couple days later, he, he pleads guilty. He does the actual pleading guilty uh, for those tribal code violations, including under the tribal code, uh, violence against a policeman. And the policeman that he's assaulted here in this Byron Swan that we talked about is a BIA officer, all right? And the BIA officer who was originally bringing him in for a violation of the tribal code, and now by assaulting him, he's performed perhaps this other violation of the tribal code, this violence against a policeman, right? He's sentenced sometime after that to 155 days in jail. Now, at the same time or within a couple months, federal prosecutors get involved, okay? And by the end of August, a federal grand jury uh, returns an indictment charge for Mr. Lara, against Mr. Lara for assault against the police officer. So what is a federal grand jury? Let me just go into that for a second. First of all, federal grand juries aren't that common uh, in, in other countries anymore. We used to have this common law system that we've talked about a little bit before uh, at least the United States had this common law system that it adopted largely from England and common law jurisdictions used to have grand juries. However, most now instead go to uh, judge or panel judges for a preliminary hearing. Grand juries are made up of citizens uh, and they there's some idea that they can bring justice. And it's interesting looking at cases in the Dakotas because oftentimes, even going back to say US versus Dion, the jury makeup is not representative of uh, native people in the area. It's often non-native people in the Dakotas who make up juries, uh, which are trying native peoples. So you can question whether or not the grand jury function or you know, the grand jury function as providing against some sort of oppressive prosecution you know, is effective in that instance. But in any case, the grand jury uh, has brought, um, has agreed that charges should be brought uh, for Mr. Lara uh, for assault against an officer. And that is a federal violation, okay? So that's different than the tribal code violation that we talked about a second ago under the Spirit Lake Tribal Code. This is actually a federal charge and it's slightly different. We've got violence against policemen and we've got assault against an officer. Before we get deeper into the issues in this case, I want to talk about a situation which had occurred a couple of years earlier in 1999. Uh, and I want you to start to think about what the issues may be in this case, um, in, in our Lara case, based on some of this, these earlier facts too. So in 1999, on the, let's see here, there was a member of the Leech Lake Reservation. We can see Leech Lake here in uh, Minnesota. Um, they are also Chippewa Ojibwe people, um, and he was over, oops, let's get back in there. He was over in, uh, on the Flathead Reservation, okay? His name was Mr. Morris. Um, so we've got a Leech Lake member over on the Flathead Reservation here, uh, in Western Montana. And he was driving a car 
near Ronan, Montana, which is uh, on the reservation. We can see it right there, Ronan. When a Ronan City police officer cited him for speeding, okay, and ordered him to appear in the tribal court of the Flathead Reservation. All right, Flathead uh, is home to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. Uh, they have a tribal college there that you might know of. Uh, but so we've got a Leech Lake tribal member, uh, Leech Lake is in Minnesota, over here on the Salish Kootenai's Flathead Reservation in Western Montana, who gets pulled over by a city police officer. And I don't know if this was a tribal officer or not, or, or what the agreement is between, between officer, between the law enforcement there. Anyway, he gets pulled over in Ronan and is ordered to appear in tribal court on the Flathead Reservation. So he appears, Mr. Morris does, and enters a plea of not guilty uh, and files a motion to dismiss the complaint against him. His motion uh, is denied and he's said that he will have to appear in tribal court by the judge of uh, First Salish Kootenai. And then he goes to federal district court and seeks uh, an injunction or seeks a declaration, I should say, that the Salish Kootenai tribe lacks criminal jurisdiction over him because he is a tribal member, but of a different tribe. So he's what they call a non-member Indian, if you're going to use that word. And he seeks, he, I mean, he does seek an injunction uh, prohibiting Salish Kootenai from continuing to exercise criminal jurisdiction over him because he's not a member of that particular tribe. So now that you know that, you can maybe get a taste for what some of the issues may be in our Lara case. All right, so back to Mr. Lara. So Mr. Lara is sitting in uh, jail, tribal jail, at Spirit Lake, and he's been, you know, for the 155 days, and now he's been charged by this federal grand jury. All right, he files a couple motions to dismiss the indictment. Uh, one of them says uh, that the indictment should be dismissed because there is selective prosecution, uh, or in the alternate, there needs to be discovery. Uh, and the other motion, which is the motion that we're really going to focus on, is uh, he moves that this. Sh indictment should be dismissed as violative of the double jeopardy clause. I'll pause for a second. Do you know what double jeopardy is? I think that most of you have probably heard that term before. There was a movie that came out in the late 90s called Double Jeopardy that had uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Ashley Judd in it. And if you remember from this movie, uh, Ashley Judd's character is accused of killing her husband, okay, and so she's sentenced to jail, and then she's let out on good behavior. It turns out that her husband had, like, faked his death, and uh, something for some life insurance policy reasons or something like that, and once Ashley Judd's character is free, uh, the idea is that she can then go ahead and kill the husband, actually, with impunity because of the double jeopardy clause. Um, because she was already prosecuted for that. And so whether that's the case or not, the Double Jeopardy Clause is in the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, and it prohibits anyone from being prosecuted twice for what is substantially the same crime. Uh, the actual Fifth Amendment says no person shall, uh, and then it says be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. And so when Mr. Lara is claiming double jeopardy here, he is claiming that he has been prosecuted twice for substantially the same crime. We know that the language is a little bit different, right? The, the wording in the tribal code, uh, this violence against a police officer is different from the assault against a federal officer, whatever the wording is uh, in the in the subsequent prosecution uh, in federal court, but it's substantially the same crime, right? Mr. Lara is arguing. 
So we've got some of what we call the procedural posture of the case history here on the screen. And we look at uh, that federal district court decision, which came down later that fall and presents these issues of whether or not the double jeopardy clause bars federal prosecution subsequent after a tribal prosecution of a non-member uh, for an offense arising from the same conduct. And that court finds that an Indian tribe's authority to prosecute a non-member is derived from the tribe's inherent powers. Uh, the federal government's authority for prosecution for the same conduct is derived from federal statute. The court says since the prosecutorial authority of the tribe and of the federal government are derived from independent sources, the dual sovereignty doctrine applies, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, federal prosecution subsequent to a tribal prosecution of a non-member Indian for a federal offense, or for an offense, I'm sorry, arising from the same conduct is not barred by the double jeopardy clause. So district court is saying that it's not barred by the double jeopardy clause because the dual sovereignty doctrine, which we'll talk about, applies and it goes on to say that Mr. Lara failed to establish that his prosecution by the federal government was impermissible uh, selective prosecution in violation of the Equal Protection Clause, uh, or that he was entitled to pursue that claim. So that's that separate uh, uh, motion that he had brought to dismiss, right? The case then goes to the Eighth Circuit. It's appealed to... Uh, the Court of Appeals, which says the Spirit Lake Nation draws its power to prosecute Lara from its retained sovereignty. Because tribal authority and federal authority arise from separate sources of the tribe's inherent power and in the federal constitution, the Double Jeopardy Clause is not offended by two separate sovereigns convicting Lara for crimes uh, arising out of the same conduct, all right? And we also see uh, in 2003, a year later, uh, the Eighth Circuit hears another part of uh, this claim and says basically they res they reviewed and they the denial of, of a motion to dismiss on double jeopardy grounds. And uh, they say that Spirit Lake Nation exercises the authority over external relations only to the extent that such a power has been delegated to it by Congress. As a non-member, Lara was necessarily prosecuted pursuant to that delegated power because the dual sovereignty doctrine does not apply where the ultimate source of power is the same. The double jeopardy clause bars the government from maintaining a second prosecution for the same act. Accordingly, the motion should have been granted and the motion to dismiss the indictment should have been granted. So we see then the court saying that in fact, uh, the dual sovereignty doctrine does not apply uh, where the ultimate source of the power is the same. And uh, in fact, the double jeopardy clause therefore bars the government from maintaining a second prosecution for the same act. All right, now from there, uh, the case is further appealed up to the US Supreme Court and what is this uh, dual sovereignty doctrine that they're talking about and how does that apply or not apply? Well, we can think of this as in uh, if a criminal defendant is being prosecuted by a state court and then a federal court, uh, they can indeed be prosecuted by each because they are separate sovereigns. Or, for example, if potentially uh, a defendant was being prosecuted in France for a crime and then was prosecuted in the United States for the same crime. Uh, there are a lot of independent variables in this and a lot of distinctions, uh, but basically the dual sovereignty doctrine or the separate sovereigns doctrine is a or is saying that the prohibition on double jeopardy does not prevent the dual prosecution when the prosecutions are separated um, or are each by separate sovereigns. Okay, so if we have two separate sovereigns, uh, double jeopardy does not stop uh, prosecution by each sovereign. And you certainly can imagine who our alleged separate sovereigns are here, right? On one side we have uh, the United States and on the other side we have the Spirit Lake tribe, right? Uh, and so this question of whether or not they're going to view the Spirit Lake tribe as a separate sovereign in this instance. 
and part of that will depend on where uh, the Supreme Court finds that the Spirit Lake uh, Nation gets their authority in order to prosecute Lara to begin with. Let's make that our first issue here. Uh, you know, what is the source of your uh, legs power to prosecute and punish Lara? Okay. Is it delegated federal authority? Or is it inherent tribal sovereignty? So that'll be one of the issues the Supreme Court will look at here. Um, and then, you know, does Congress and US Congress, let's just write that in there actually. Does Congress possess constitutional power to change restrictions on Spirit Lake's criminal jurisdiction? Over non-members, non-member actually, we'll say over non-member tribal members, right? This is a or non-member Indians. Um, those, those things can mean two different things. We have to remember that there, you know, depending on the what you're looking at, you might get and, and the federal agency you're working with, or you know whether it's a state or a tribal situation. There are uh, recognized, federally recognized tribes. There are also uh, non-recognized tribes. There are also people who are, uh, you know, tribal or are, you know are genetically related to tribal members but are not enrolled in their tribes. Uh, or are you know otherwise not a part of the federal system and might be still considered Indians even though they're not tribal members in certain instances and so we have a lot of questions surrounding uh, what non-members we're actually looking at here but for the second question does the U.S. Congress possess the constitutional power to change restrictions and that might be lifting restrictions, that might be relaxing restrictions on Spirit Lake or any tribe's uh, criminal jurisdiction over non-member Indians. Uh, basically that, that uh, other, or I guess that um, had been imposed by the government, okay? So these are restrictions that have been imposed by the government. And then, you know, does the double jeopardy laws bar federal prosecution uh, of Lara? Uh, does, it, does it bar him, af, you know, for assaulting the policeman, the federal officer after he's been prosecuted and punished for the uh, tribal offense, right? Um, so does the double, double jeopardy, let's try to spell that right, does the double jeopardy clause bar federal prosecution of Laura after he's been prosecuted and punished? So he's actually even served his time uh, and related to that, you know, whether there needs to be a showing that that tribal prosecution was based on federal power. So does the double jeopardy clause bar federal prosecution of Laura after he's been prosecuted and punished um, by Spirit Lake? Um, and then maybe we'll also look at their you know, whether or not uh, there is a 
showing of the source or that the source. Of the fraud prosecution was federal, uh, you know, was federal either constitutional or congressional power. The source of the Spirit Lakes. Okay, so these are the three main issues that the United States Supreme Court is kind of going to look at here. And I really encourage you to check out the OYA argument for this case, all right? Uh, we know how you can get to OYA, um, and actually, let's go to it right here. And under OYA, you can find this in your uh, my SBC. Hold on a second, the screen's stuck. One second, please. All right, so you can find this in your my SBC, the link to this, and uh, you know you can read the opinion on here. You can look at the syllabus of the case. Um, you can check out this brief overview, right? Uh, and then you can actually listen to both the oral argument and the opinion announcement. The opinion announcement is usually five to ten minutes, sometimes even less. Um, and the oral argument is an hour. And in the oral argument, you will hear uh, both sides. And it's in this case in particular, I really, really recommend you know listening to some of the oral argument because the questions posed are really questions of the United States Supreme Court to both the petitioner and the respondent about the nature of tribal sovereignty. And so in our other cases this semester, we've considered tribal sovereignty, or we've considered these the cases through the lens of tribal sovereignty, but here in particular, the actual word sovereignty, but also just these sovereignty concepts repeatedly come up. So if you have a chance, you know, put this on, um, you can just go ahead and put it on your phone. You can get OEA actually via uh, either Apple Podcasts or the Android, an Android podcast app. And um, OEA has their own podcast. They have the oral arguments going back for a number of years now, um, not too far back, but you could get the podcast where you have Wi-Fi and download it, and then you could listen to it. Uh, and you could even, you know, if you're in the kitchen with your family or something, it's an interesting case to listen to this case in particular, United States versus Lara, because the oral argument contains so many questions about tribal sovereignty. So I really recommend in this case, you actually take some time and listen to the oral argument. But uh, let's go back to this case for one second. Um, and actually, we'll, we'll look on on OYA kind of how they define the main issue. And under OYA, they're they're going to get into the Indian Civil Rights Act, which we'll get into as well. And they're asking, you know, does the Indian Civil Rights Act give Indian tribes a separate sovereignty to prosecute non-members as opposed to delegating federal power to the tribes for prosecution purposes, such that the prosecution in tribal and federal courts for the same crime would not violate the Fifth Amendment Double Jeopardy Clause. So this, this is similar to what kind of we're asking here, right? Um, I didn't necessarily put in ICRA, the Indian Civil Rights Act, um, but these are, you know, that is that is a uh, act that Congress passed following a different case called Duro versus Reina to fix what they called sort of the Duro loophole. And actually we will go into that. So let's go into that for a second. Okay, because this is a Native American studies class and we do put a focus on the tribes, whether or not they're remembered in Supreme Court, uh, let's go from where we currently are talking about Lara on the Spirit Lake Reservation, remembering that uh, Lara was actually from Turtle Mountain and then the incident occurred over on the Spirit Lake Reservation and zoom out and zoom past uh, Zoom past quickly Montana and the Flathead Reservation, home to the Salish Kootenai, where uh, we had Mr. Morris that we discussed earlier for a brief second, coming over from Leech Lake in Minnesota. And let's 
fly on the map down here to uh, let's see here if we can find it if I can find it um, the Torres Martinez reservation uh, where we have uh, the desert Kalia a tribe the Torres Martinez desert Kalia tribe and we have Mr. Albert Duro and so he's not here though as you might have guessed, this is about something that happened when he was in fact uh, on another part of tribal land and actually over here near Phoenix on the Indian community of the Salt River Pima Maricopa. Okay, so we've got uh, Mr. Albert Duro who's over uh, in present day Arizona and this is an awful case, but he's accused of killing a 14 year old boy. As we've discussed a little bit, and we won't go into more here, uh, tribal courts have at times been limited and still are actually quite limited, although that is re-expanding or expanding back uh, to, you know, misdemeanor offenses. And so the federal government, uh, gives Duro after he's arrested for killing this boy within the boundaries of the reservation. Originally he's charged in federal court uh, for murder and aiding and abetting and then prosecution dismisses those and he's handed over to the Salt River Maricopa tribal authorities. They charge him with illegally firing a weapon under federal law, um, which is a misdemeanor because that's what they are limited to prosecuting. And he moves, Mr. Dro moves to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. And he says that the Pima Maricopa tribe doesn't have jurisdiction over him as a non-member. And basically that as a non-member, he can't vote. He can't participate in tribal elections. He can't vote in tribal elections, I should say. He can't participate in, um, as, a, you know, as running in tribal elections and he can't participate in tribal juries. Now he might uh, avail himself of other benefits of you know being a native person living on the Pima Maricopa reservation, um, but what happens is that that case makes it all the way up. Uh, he, I mean, he files a writ of habeas corpus in the district court, which again we're seeing uh, you know these cases move from tribal court to somebody not being happy with the tribal court decision, which is actually what we've seen in pretty much every case this semester, right? Uh, is like we saw in Nevada versus Hicks. Uh, and I don't recall if we saw that. Actually, we didn't see that in United States versus White Mountain Apache, I don't think, although I might be misremembering. But we're seeing, you know, one party being unhappy with what the tribal court decision was and deciding to get a second opinion, um, which what a luxury that is, in uh, district court. Okay. And uh, Mr. Duro does that. Now, the case makes it up to the U.S. Supreme Court. This is a previous case, and it's not within the scope of our contemporary Supreme Court jurisprudence, but the case makes it up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decides that tribes can't prosecute, uh, we'll use the word Indians, to mean both, you know, non-members um, who are members of other tribes and uh, just non-members who are native, uh, the court concludes that the tribes can't prosecute Indians who are members of other tribes for crimes committed by those non-members on uh, their reservations, on the reservation that is prosecuting them. So this decision, as you might imagine, creates a big outcry because you're stripping, or the Supreme Court, not you, obviously, but the Supreme Court is stripping more of the tribe's ability to have basic law and order over its reservation, right? Uh, by removing now the ability to prosecute non-tribal member Indians who are on the reservation. And there are a lot of other issues that go along with that. So Congress recognizes quickly that there's a problem there and goes ahead uh, and let me see if I can pull this up quickly. Yes, all right. 
uh, goes ahead and amends the Indian Civil Rights Act. Um, uh, chapter, title 25 of the US Code is titled Indians and uh, section 1301 includes this powers of self-government section that you see here. Um, means and includes all governmental powers possessed by an Indian tribe, executive, legislative, and judicial. Okay, uh, that's what powers of self-government means. And Congress goes ahead and includes this last part right here. And it says um, to exercise criminal jurisdiction over all Indians. Okay, so not just tribal members, but members of other tribes, um, and you know potentially, you know, non-member Indians. Although that's a that's a whole other thing. But we see that's what that's what's called the Duro fix. Okay, so we had that Duro case, and um, then we had Congress act to say, in fact, um, that tribes do have jurisdiction over non-member Indians. Okay. So let's now fly on our Google Maps away from the Salt River Pima Maricopa. Uh, community in present-day Arizona, all the way back up to present-day North Dakota, where we have Mr. Lara, right? Actually, it's in the Supreme Court, but we know that we're working uh, on this about Mr. Lara, who is being, has been prosecuted on the Spirit Lake Reservation. And actually, let's Listen in for the beginning of um, some of the oral argument at the US Supreme Court. And we've just learned about this Duro fix that Congress did, right? Inserting that language relating to all Indians into the US code um, as part of the tribe's rights of self-government and closing that potential jurisdictional loophole. So let's listen to this. We are going to hear uh, when you listen to an oral argument in OYE, and I know that many of you are, are doing this as part of this course, the reason that the, uh, in this case, the government, the US is going first is because the side bringing the case or appealing the case uh, is the side that bears the burden of proof at the base level and thus always goes first. So. Uh, that would be in a criminal case, the prosecuting attorney, uh, or in a civil case, the plaintiff, or here at the Supreme Court, we have the petitioner, the one who petitioned the Supreme Court and was granted that writ of certiorari, the United States, who has, you know, appealed up to the Supreme Court. Um, so they are going to give their argument first, followed by the respondent, Mr. Lara, um, Mr. Lara's attorney. And actually, the You'll probably notice this, sometimes they reserve time, they're allowed to reserve uh, a certain amount of time, uh, you know, and, and they only get what they reserve uh, for, to be able to say something at the very end of the case too. So the petitioner has the first word and in fact um, gets to respond, so kind of has the last word and they are the ones who uh, are bringing the case, so they are the ones who are potentially the aggrieved party and the idea is that there's some sort of I don't know if they're the aggrieved party, I take that back actually, but the idea is that there's some sort of fairness involved there. Okay, all right, so uh, we're in the Supreme Court. We've got, uh, we've got this argument getting going, so let's listen in. We'll hear argument now, number 03107, the United States versus Billy Joe Lara, <laughs> Mr. Needler. Mr. Chief Justice, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, Mr. Chief, I don't know why it isn't highlighting. Mr. Chief Justice, it's helpful for you all if it highlights. I know that. Let's try to bring that up again. Sorry about that. Uh, you'll notice if you have listened to this on your own as you go through, and probably when we've gone through opinion announcements in other cases, you'll notice that it does highlight. So let's have it do that. There we go. Okay. We'll hear argument now, number 03107, the United States versus Billy Joe Lara. <laughs> Mr. Needler. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. I apologize, it's just not going to do it, so we'll just continue on, okay? Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Fourteen years ago, in the Doro decision, this court held that under the state of Indian law, as it then stood, an Indian tribe could not prosecute an Indian who was not a member of uh, that tribe. The court recognized, though, that its decision might create a jurisdictional gap on many reservations. 
but the court concluded that if the present jurisdictional regime proves insufficient to meet the needs of reservation law enforcement, the proper body to address that concern is Congress, which has plenary power over Indian affairs. Congress responded immediately to this court's decision. It, it conducted an extensive inquiry and heard hearings uh, about the consequences of the court's decision and heard strong expressions of concern by many Indian tribes, by the federal government, and by numerous states about the law enforcement vacuum that would be created over many misdemeanor offenses on Indian reservations. And there was widespread support for Congress to restore the power to Indian tribes to exercise their sovereign power to prosecute non-member Indians. Now, why didn't, why didn't they extend it to non-Indians? I mean, if it's a problem, uh, when a, uh, a non-member Indian. So actually, let me just point out, they had, they had Mr. S or Justice Scalia highlighted there. Um, that wasn't Justice Scalia, Scalia talking, right? That was um, the, the United States attorney, um, Mr. Needler. Um, but we're hearing this right off the bat, this huge question, right? It's Justice Kennedy saying, why didn't they extend? Why didn't Congress extend uh, tribes ability to exercise their sovereign power um, to non-Indians. And let's just listen, let's listen to a little bit more. He commits an offense on an Indian reservation. Why isn't it an equivalent problem when a, uh, a white man commits the same crime on an Indian reservation? I think the answer lies in the, in the longstanding jurisdictional regime on Indian reservations. Uh, going back to 1817, uh, the General Indian Crimes Statute has authorized prosecutions by the federal government over crimes committed by non-Indians, uh, including misdemeanor crimes. And so there was not a jurisdictional void that the difficulty came, the, the, the most acute difficulty came from the fact that that statute, again, since the earliest times has, has exempted crimes committed by one Indian against the person or property of another. Well, why couldn't they have changed that? They could have solved the problem by simply treating non-member Indians the same way they treat non-Indians. Congress could have done so, but Congress, uh, with a plenary power over Indian affairs, uh, chose, uh, decided that the proper course, or the more, most appropriate course, was to have that jurisdiction exercised by the Indian tribes. And Congress heard considerable, considerable evidence that that power had long, in fact, been exercised by Indian tribes over other Indians who were not members of the particular tribe. There's some ambiguity about what. Okay, so I could go on and listen to this again. Uh, I think I've listened to this about five or six times in preparation for this class. I really recommend that this oral argument you give a listen to because the Supreme Court kind of expresses, the justices kind of express a lot of their general questions about Indian law in this um, in this oral argument and to these attorneys, um, you know, who who weren't maybe when they this case was originally brought planning to argue such giant issues of federal Indian law. Uh, but I want to pause us there because I want us to focus on some key parts of this and these key issues um, so that we can come to a semi succinct conclusion. So let me pause there for a second. And let's jump into the case uh, to part two of the actual case. Remember that these cases are uploaded in your MySBC as PDFs. You can go in each week and read those under coursework. Um, but you can also just Google the case uh, site that 541 US 193 uh, or one of the other sites and you can find, you know, any copy of this case on uh, whether it be a different kind of, you know, different website or have a different format or have some notes or whatever. So we're just gonna go and use a copy from Google Scholar right here. Google Scholar has these cases up and we'll go down to part two of the actual opinion. In this case, there are a lot of different concurring, concurring in judgment, dissenting opinions. Um, remember when we talked about those, those are at the bottom. Uh, the main thing to, to try to give a read to is that actual opinion. And you don't have to worry so much about the rest, but you're welcome to it. Uh, the only thing which has presidential value uh, is technically the opinion, although sometimes people do cite dissents and people do cite concurring opinions or opinions concurring in the judgment. Uh, but let's stick with the opinion for now. So we're in part two of the opinion and we see the Supreme Court addressing 
uh, this double jeopardy, du dual sovereignty question, which we went over earlier. So it's, they say, Justice Breyer, I believe, wrote this opinion. Uh, he says, we assume as do the parties that Lara's double jeopardy claim turns on the answer to the dual sovereignty question. What is the source of the power to punish non-member Indian offenders? Uh, is it inherent tribal sovereignty? sovereignty or delegated federal authority? And that's one of those questions that we actually wrote down earlier when we were looking at uh, uh, what, what the issues in the Supreme Court were going to be. I don't know if I can find that quickly to pull it up. So you might just have to trust me on that one and go back and look. Oh, here we go, actually. All right. So what is the source of Spirit Lake's power to prosecute and punish Lara? Is it delegated federal authority or is it tribal, inherent tribal sovereignty? And so that's what the Supreme Court actually discusses right here. And the Supreme Court says that they believe that Congress intended it to be inherent tribal sovereignty, all right? So Congress has restored some of what is uh, inherent to the tribe's ability to have law and order over its lands, right? And saying, the Supreme Court is saying that uh, Congress has recognized and affirmed in each tribe this inherent tribal power. Uh, so it's not delegated federal power to prosecute non-member Indians for misdemeanors. All right. That brings us into our second question, you know, does the Congress possess this power to change restrictions, whether that be to relax or to tighten restrictions on the tribe's criminal jurisdiction over non-member tribal members or Indians um, that has been imposed by the government? And we see the Supreme Court in its opinion uh, saying that, in fact, um, Congress has sought to adjust tribe statuses and relax uh, restrictions recognized in Duro that the political branches had imposed on tribes exercise of, exercise of inherent prosecutorial power, which is uh, kind of gets us into our third issue that we were looking at here. Uh, the Supreme Court goes on to say that the question before the Supreme Court is whether the Constitution authorizes Congress to do so. Can Congress change? Uh, you know, anything to do with tribes exercise of inherent prosecutorial power. And the Supreme Court finds that Congress does in fact possess constitutional power to lift the restrictions on tribes criminal jurisdiction over non-member Indians. Now, let me tell you that um, these are big issues, okay? And uh, as we, as is very clear, I'm sure you can tell that. And uh, when this case was before the Supreme Court, there were a lot of interested parties, right? There are interested parties who were states, interested parties who were other tribes. And so there were quite a few um, amicus or amicus briefs filed for this case. For example, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers uh, filed a brief in support of Mr. Lara. Um, so did the uh, Citizens Equal Rights Foundation in part. Uh, so did uh, various counties, uh, Mille Lacs County in Minnesota, Thurston County in Nebraska. And uh, Mr. Morris, if you remember Mr. Morris uh, from uh, over in Montana, he filed a brief in support of Mr. Lara, uh, you remember he was stopped uh, for some sort of traffic offense on uh, the Flathead Reservation. And on the other side, we see the states, uh, many states, not all states, but some states supporting uh, the United States, uh, Washington, Arizona, California, Colorado, Michigan, Montana, New Mexico, Oregon, supporting the United States argument um, and, and actually the National Congress of American Indians in supporting the United States arguments. So why do you think that there are, uh, what do you think the National Congress of 
American Indians isn't supporting uh, Mr. Lara in this case, right? They're actually supporting the petitioner of the United States. And we will go into this more in our tribal sovereignty discussion group, but I want to throw that out there now as something that you can actually start to consider. Or I think we will, and we'll try to touch on that. Uh, you've also got amicus briefs or amicus briefs from the states of Idaho, Louisiana, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Utah supporting the petitioner. Uh, and you have 18 Indian tribes uh, supporting the petitioner in a different brief. So we have a lot of briefs here. I don't know if. Um, I don't know if any of the tribes of which you students are members signed on to that. Um, I can try to figure that out quickly. I think uh, Lakota Ray, Men uh, Menominee, uh, Metlakata, Mississippi Band of Choctaw, Aglala. Okay, so three affiliated tribes. All right, um, Salish Kootenai. Quite a few. All right. So we do see um, Lakota Ray, uh, Lummi, uh, Mohegan, Nez Perce. All right. So we've seen uh, from this Dakota's area, we've seen three affiliated tribes. Oh, and the, and the Spirit Lake Sioux tribe um, from North Dakota, three affiliated, or in, in present day North Dakota, three affiliated as well. And then uh, Aglala on the South Dakota side. So they're all actually writing on behalf or in favor of the petitioner of the United States in this suit too. All right, so again, we'll we'll talk more about that. Uh, and so the court is looking at whether or not the constitution authorizes Congress the power to relax these restrictions um, that political branches had imposed on tribes and kind of in the question um, that had been posed by the government uh, or yeah so by the government or I guess we can even say better by political branches All right, we can spell that correctly um, so does Cong does Congress have this power and the court says to answer that issue to answer that question that the Constitution grants Congress broad powers to legislate Okay, and the court has said that those are plenary and exclusive um, plenary powers. We've talked about those of Congress. That's how the court reads that it has such jurisdiction over tribes to begin with, right? That they've traditionally looked to the Indian Commerce Clause uh, and the Treaty Clause in the Constitution. Uh, we either have talked about those or we will talk about them more. Uh, Morton versus Mankari, some other cases there. And They've said that the central function of the Indian Commerce Clause is to provide Congress with plenary power to legislate in the, in the field of Indian affairs. So Congress has the power. The treaty power doesn't literally authorize Congress to make or to act legislatively, uh, the Supreme Court says here, but he says that treaties made, or they say that treaties made pursuant to that power can authorize them to deal with matters which they could not otherwise deal with. All right. So uh, the, the Supreme Court goes on to say that in 1871, Congress ended the treaty making with tribes, uh, but uh, the statute saved existing treaties from being invalidated or impaired. And Congress has, or the Supreme Court has previously stated that the statute in no way affected Congress's plenary powers to legislate. So Congress has these powers. Uh, Moreover, at least in the first century of America's national existence. All right, we kind of get into the weeds here, which I don't want to do. Um, but we see that the Supreme Court is uh, indeed finding that uh, there is this uh, ability of Congress to legislate on these matters, all right? And that's a main question that we are looking at here. And so that's useful for us to understand what is happening in this case. So let's go back over to our questions. And in fact, the answer to that first question we've just heard is that it is this 
inherent Bible sovereignty, right? And we're moving into this second question. And indeed, the court is ruling um, that Congress does possess uh, power to lift or relax these restrictions uh, or these impediments. Uh, you know, they might not be, they might be formerly created like restrictions on tribes, criminal jurisdiction. So yes, um, Congress can change restrictions is what the Supreme Court is saying there. And we've heard, we heard a little bit of that. Again, this is a super complicated case, okay? Uh, but it's worth a try. And I think, you know, we can try to move through it in some real basic ways and, and understand some things that come out of it. All right, so let's move down and get to the double jeopardy sort of holding more. Uh, let's see, six, our conclusion that Congress has the power to relax restrictions is consistent. Okay, so they're just going through still, uh, and this is all, you know, super important stuff if you're interested in federal Indian law but we are moving through this quickly to get to uh, this holding related to sovereignty and uh, the double jeopardy clause. And here we do see that. Consequently, the double jeopardy clause does not prohibit the federal government from proceeding with the present prosecution for a discrete federal offense. So they're saying that in fact, this is a discrete federal offense. And so the answer to our third question is, um, does the double jeopardy clause bar it? And um, no, the double jeopardy clause is not far, and you can read back in the case to kind of learn more about how they actually created their decision in regards to that. All right, so that is gonna be the end of how closely we are gonna look at the case, but I still want us to look at a little bit more of the oral, oral argument because as Native American studies students, I think that, and in particular as students in this sovereignty related class, uh, some of these arguments are are just good things to be thinking about, um, or I don't know, that's kind of a strange way for me to phrase that, but are, might be uh, interesting to think about. So let's go back, and in particular, I want you to hear uh, this. Let's see here. Um, so let's go to this part of the argument. All right. Let's listen to a question that uh, John Paul Stevens is asking. We're still in the petitioner's side of the argument. So we've got the attorney representing the United States. Uh, I'm sorry, not the attorney representing the United States. Uh, Mr. Reichardt is representing the respondent. He's representing Mr. Lara. So actually we're onto the respondent side. So we've got um, the attorney representing the respondent, representing Mr. Lara. And he's been asked a series of questions here about uh, international jurisdictions uh, and whether or not, you know, related to sovereignty, uh, you know, Puerto Rico, for example, has a difference than tribes. Now, these are, are fundamental uh, sort of resolved issues within federal Indian law and tribal law, uh, the issues of the differences between tribes and territories. Although there, you know, you might argue, you might think, why are there these differences? And, and you might want to explore that a little bit. And you might argue that there shouldn't be. So uh, certainly we can see why uh, the Supreme Court might be asking, uh, although this would go against their previous precedent. But let's go down to here to a question Oops. that- uh, To address that, Puerto Rico is- Apparently there's a bit of a laugh there. Uh, We'll go down to Justice Stevens' question here. And I think this is kind of an interesting question. 
But then that seems to me that's kind of a critical part of the case. Where they, supposing the tribe had a, a criminal statute and saying you cannot cut trees above 5,000 feet on the mountains because that's sacred land or something like that. And Congress decided they wanted to build a road up there, so they preempted the, the Indian statute and said we cannot enforce that statute. And after they built the road, they decided well, they let them go back to the way they did, and they said we repeal the preempting statute. Now, would that be a delegation of power to to uh, protect those religious grounds, or would that be just a restoration of a pre-existing sovereign power? All right, so I want you to think about that question that Justice Stevens has just posed, and we will discuss, I think we'll definitely discuss that as part of our Tribal Sovereignty Discussion Group this week, um, this idea that Congress could, or let's say, supposing the tribe had a criminal statute where you couldn't cut down um, trees because it's sacred land and Congress decided to build a road and so they preempted that statute. They uh, basically said, not not necessarily invalidated, but they said we come first, we get to decide what goes on here. Um, and let, uh, let a road be built, okay, um, on what the tribe is, has said is their sacred land. And after they build the road, they decide, you know, you can go back to the way it was. This back and forth, this ebb and flow of, uh, you know, Congress, you know, releasing restrictions and tightening restrictions and everything else. I want you to think about some of the effects that this has had on tribes. Now, certainly, uh, we can kind of look at the history of, of Congress's actions against tribes and we can look at say for example the termination error and other uh horrendous kind of errors in american history where we've where the where the united states has either tried to um i guess you know in the early days tried to you know either uh, militarily use force to um exterminate or commit some sort of genocide against tribes which i don't think is an overstatement uh, we, as we discussed in that last case versus about United States versus White Mount Apache, this idea of, you know, forts being created to, to kill tribal members in the area um, and to allow colonists to have that land. So this idea that going back to uh, where Congress originally had these powers that they've, that they've in fact, um, and then later on in the termination when they decided to not, you know, maybe not get rid of Indian people per se, but get rid of tribes and thereby, you know, maybe forcibly assimilate native people or something like that. And we've had Congress at times impose these really tight restrictions. And it, in fact, after treaties were made and even sometimes during the treaty making process, the restrictions that were imposed were tighter than uh, they, needed to be or you know were more restricting um, than they needed to be and the supreme court has told us in this case as we just discussed um, or as we very briefly discuss it and we put, put in answers to those issues that congress does have ability to change restrictions and tighten or loosen we talked about before this idea of like the cookie versus the nerf ball Th these aren't things that were completely taken away from tribes forever. These are things that were kind of squeezed in or are now and are now being released or whatever um, restrictions that Congress has put on at times and removed at other times. And I think I want to take a moment and Justice John Paul Stevens um, mentions this, you know, to recognize the damaging effects that such a back and forth of uh, restrictions has had on tribes over time, right? And certainly I'm not arguing or I'm not suggesting that uh, tribes should not, you know, regain um, some of their rights, right? Like Congress should definitely release these, I, I, would, I would say, should definitely provide back to tribes their original rights, right? Which it has over time, knowingly or unknowingly, uh, stripped from tribes for some purpose and then given back. And so, you know, these, these abilities should be provided back to tribes and Congress, uh, the Supreme Court has said was trying to do that in the Duro fix. They were trying to do that in that all Indians language uh, in the US code is 
make it clear that the tribes in fact have this ability, um, whether or not they had had it before Congress explicitly put it in there, you know, you might argue either way. Um, but, but they're, you know, let's acknowledge the potential damaging effects of this back and forth. All right, so let me, let me go down to a different uh, part of uh, the oral argument. And we'll look at another, another question here. Actually, we won't even get to that other question. We'll go actually right here. To so is it power? Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, asked questions with these ideas that we were just talking about. Let's listen for a second. Always to take away, but never to give back. It's yes, but Congress no, but can always give back using their plenary power. Congress can always delegate powers back to the tribes. It simply cannot make sovereign that which is not. That which but is do we, I'm sorry. Do we, we have to get <laughs> what transplanted the tribes from independent sovereigns to dependent sovereigns was not a decision of this court, an act of Congress, it was the acts of the legislature, and they took over a lot of things that were previously independent sovereignty of the tribes. And if you go back a couple hundred years, they clearly had their own inherent power to try non-members. Maybe they lost it in the change in the relationship between the United States and the tribe, but that's not as a result of an act of Congress or decision of this court. It's a result of historical events. It's a result, Your Honor. Okay, so interesting to hear, um, interesting is one word, to hear Justice John Paul Stevens' uh, argument there or question there, um, definitely kind of a question uh, about this switch from being independent sovereigns to dependent sovereigns. And that goes to, um, you know, this, this sort of last question. And uh, we are saying that no, the double jeopardy clause does not bar. Um, and we're saying that because uh, if there's no, Sure, sure, oh my god, sure, source that it came from federal power. Uh, so that it could be, could have come from, in fact, the inherent power. And furthermore, because it came from this, what the Supreme Court had called, um, let's put in there, this successive because the prosecutions were brought by successive and distinct sovereign bodies. All right. So with that, oh my goodness, uh, we have taken a little trip into United States versus Lara. Let me just do a rundown real quick of what we've gone over uh, in this case. We've got, this is a pretty big case, okay? And the ultimate holding or one ultimate holding of this case is that both the United States and tribes can prosecute um, Native Americans, Indians, Indian under uh, how it's defined for the same acts that constitute crimes in both jurisdictions. Okay. So it doesn't even matter that we had that slight different in language difference in language. Um, uh, the Supreme Court is holding that, that both can prosecute because they are separate sovereigns, all right? And then we have that, that's why we have that dual sovereignty doctrine or that separate sovereigns doctrine. Uh, separate tribal and federal prosecutions do not violate the double jeopardy clause. Uh, and because of the Duro fix, Congress language in inserting after the Duro case um, and after the Supreme Court kind of opened the door for it to uh, after the Duro case, or I don't know if suggested it's too strong a word, but, um, and that edit to ICRA, that uh, they can they can do this to members of other tribes, all right? So way back, we had the Major Crimes Act uh, that took criminal jurisdiction from tribes, uh, and that changed on and off, but in 1990 in Dura versus Reyna, tribes were ruled to not have the authority to not, uh, to, I mean, to try 
non-tribal member Indians uh, to have juris criminal jurisdiction over them, I should say. And then Congress immediately followed up with uh, this change to insert all Indians into the US code uh, that we've talked about um, on the basis of tribes inherent sovereignty, which we didn't go into a ton on this video uh, in the sense of how Congress uh, made this clear and how the Supreme Court read Congress is making this clear, uh, but that tribes indeed had this inherent sovereignty to try non-members um, and historically had this sovereignty, okay? So our defendant, Billy Joe Lara, um, had been charged and he pled guilty. And in fact, the Supreme Court ruling meant that uh, Billy Joe Lara could actually be tried by the United States as well. Now let's just remember though that there are you know, certain limitations to um, the way he could be tried in tribal court, and things like that related to the, the sentencing and the amount of time and, and everything else. But he had, he had chosen to be on that reservation, right? And he had chosen to, uh, and in fact, after he'd been effectively banished, uh, you know, he had a, there was an order for him not to come on the reservation. He chose to go on the reservation nonetheless, and um, therefore did subject himself to the tribe's jurisdiction in addition to the jurisdiction of the United States separately as uh, the Supreme Court has ruled in this case. So with that, thank you, thank you, thank you for sticking with me. I really appreciate it. And I really look forward to seeing you all uh, on Wednesday night. And if you get a chance, listen to that Oya, you know, listen to it with your boyfriend or girlfriend or partner or whatever, uh, and uh, your family or whoever, your kids, your grandparents, whatever. Uh, and, you know, maybe think about some of the questions that justices throw out, because unlike many of the other oral arguments that are uh, of the cases of this semester, this one really has a lot of questions that are specifically on point to the types of sovereignty issues that we are discussing in our tribal sovereignty discussion group. So thank you and I will see you then.